Welcome back to ET 2021. This is our third and I always have a hard time saying this, you know, final day of the conference. It's been amazing so far, thanks to all our speakers, all our attendees. Uh, second time we're doing this in, in virtually and it's going um, really, really well. I think we're hitting home runs back and forth. So um, very, very excited for the third day as well. Uh, just uh, please note that the discussion for uh, ET is taking place on Slack. Um, you've received an invitation via email. We're also going to be placing the link in the Zoom chat. So if you are not on Slack, I highly recommend getting on there. A lot of great conversations, a lot of Q&A happening on there. So uh, please check that out. Uh, the discussion for this keynote specifically is going to be in the keynote channel on that Slack. If you haven't joined the channel, please do. Um, we're going to be looking at Zoom chat for questions and for that um, after uh, the keynote. So uh, please uh, check out both of those. Um, again, all the talks are going to be recorded and shared with attendees uh, within the next week. So again, we want to thank you for joining us um, for these past few days and uh, looking forward to the keynote and all the talks today. So um, I'm Sujan Kapadia. Uh, I work for Chariot Solutions, a premier software development consultancy focusing on applications, cloud, mobile, data engineering, and IoT. Um, for over 18 years, companies of all sizes across many industries have turned to Chariot to help them solve their toughest software challenges and move business forward. Chariot is proud to be hosting ET along with the Philadelphia community. Um, so <clears throat> there are a few who devote as much of their life to the craft of developing software, systems, and people as Jessica Kerr. She has spoken on topics ranging from resilience engineering languages and functional programming to collaboration, automation, and systems thinking. Finally, uh, Jessica is a friend of ET, a committee member who helps organize this conference and has continued to honor us by speaking here. Um, next, it's almost impossible to truly assess the revolutionary impact Ken Beck has had and continues to have on software development. The essence of software is change. And that is at the heart of extreme programming, a discipline Kent developed to intensely focus on delivering working software. Through practices like test-driven development and pair programming, Kent has shown the way to high quality software that meets ever-changing needs. To countless developers, he's brought joy to seeing a test fail. Jessica and Kent help us realize software development is just as much about the human interactions as it is about the code, perhaps even more. And without further ado, Philly ET, please join me in welcoming Kent Beck and Jessica Kerr. Thank you, very thank, thank you so much. Absolutely. Clearly, we practice this. <laughs> uh, Kent, uh, yes, glad, Jess, how are you? I'm great. I'm great. I'm glad to see you today because I have a problem that I want to run by you. Oh, I'm glad to run into you too here in this coffee shop. Uh, I have a problem I'd like to run into, uh, to run by you as well. Ooh, is it work or personal? This is the part of the dialogue where it says, uh, improvise dialogue, make it sincere. <laughs> uh, it's uh, Mine's a work problem, what's oh. yours? Okay, mine's personal, so let's do yours first. Okay, okay, okay. So, so uh, I'm, you know, I'm working on this system and uh, we're having too many crashes. Uh-oh. And uh, of course you can't have crashes. And so I added some logging statements just to find out what was going on, you know, as one does. As one does. Okay, so you're looking for the logging statements to give you information. Information so we can have fewer crashes. That can lead to fewer crashes. All right. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so you're looking to do a balancing loop to reduce the number of crashes, more crashes yeah. leads to more investigation. So you can yeah. have fewer crashes again. Yeah, All right. exactly, Makes exactly sense. right. So where's the problem here? Yeah, it's, it's now the system crashes all the time. Oh no, oh no, wait, 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 wait. Let me guess, let me guess. You filled up the disk with logs. <laughs> You've done this before too? Yes, oh, yeah. exactly right. <laughs> so, yeah, that's the thing with logging. It reduces your free disk space, uh -huh. which is fine until yeah. it's not. Until, until it's it, not. Yep. Until at some point that disk space hits zero 
And now the more, the less disk space you have, it can't help but crash. Uh, and that- a, a, a less disk space, uh, more disk, yes, yes, correct. Correct. I'm reading. I'm reading the diagram. Right. So I'm. I'm. I'm devastated. I'm emotionally verklempt <laughs> because I was trying to make things better, and and now I uh, now servers stay up for half a second, and then just go away. You're right. What are we supposed to do when our attempts to make things better just make it worse? <sighs> let me tell you. Let me tell you about another one of those. Okay. Okay. All right. All right. Let me uh, let me get here. I got to draw two. If you can draw, I can draw. Right. OK, so tell me about your situation. OK, uh, mine is a lot harder because it has to do with teenagers. <laughs> it's, specifically... it's not just a people problem. It's a teenager problem. <laughs> got it. Although, really, I can't blame them. So my child, Ren, has a lot of missing homework. Uh-oh, missing homework. Yep, missing homework. And as a parent, it's my job to get them to do their homework, right? So they don't have so much missing homework. Sure. So I try, I try when I see that they have missing homework, I try to check in. Okay. Um, check in with them to get them to do their homework um, so that the missing homework will, will be be less. So it'll okay. keep the amount of missing homework down somewhat. So you're checking in, mm -hmm. which causes them to do homework. That's the theory. <laughs> homework. Or maybe this should be homework done. But anyway, I'll just go with it. So the more you check in, the more they do their homework. That's the plan. Because that's what teenagers do. And the oh. more they do their homework, the less missing homework there is. Yeah, I mean, do homework. That's how you reduce missing homework. And so we have. That's the balancing nice loop I'm inhibiting. trying to make here. Got it. But you say you say balancing loop. I say inhibiting loop. Inhibiting loop. That's true. Whatever. The missing fine. homework from getting too far. Above but zero. you can summarize that cycle as the more missing homework there is, the less missing homework there is. That's the goal. That's, That's the goal. The goal. Okay, and it works. Missing homework by reducing missing homework. You're a quality parent. <laughs> you care. I'm a parent. I do care. I definitely care. Okay, okay. And so this works, right? Occasionally. <laughs> okay, and, and tell, tell me about it not working. But, but checking in doesn't always result in doing homework. Sometimes instead, sometimes I run out of patience and I yell. And the yelling just stresses run out. And then when they're stressed, they, they can't do homework at all. Okay, so you check in. Oh, oh, wait, wait, wait. So I'm missing a step here. So you check in, I'm gonna raise, all right. You so you have some patience. Some, yeah. Of course, I'm, you're patient. I mean, I'm, I'm supposed to be patient as a parent, but Sometimes, and, and it's not always about rent. I mean, the missing homework makes me feel frustrated. Yeah. Uh, but sometimes my patience is just low because the cat's torn another key off my keyboard, regardless. Okay. So, so some, something interfered with your patience or, but it can be, now does it, is it the, the missing homework itself no. or is it the checking in that? When I have tried. to check in, that totally frustrates me because I have work to do. You know, I have my grown up work to do that I'm not excited about either. And instead, I'm I'm spending time tracking their homework and checking in with them. Okay, and then so, yeah, that you're right. Checking in also reduces my patience. And when that hits zero, then then sometimes I yell at them. Okay, so less patience at some point leads to yelling. And the uh, yelling yeah. leads to stress. Mm -hmm. I, I just see it. I see. And just, well, I mean, it stresses me out. And, and I see and, and, and more stress leads to doing more homework, right? Leads to not doing homework. Oh, that's not the way this when they're super is stressed. supposed to go. All right. More stress means leads to less doing homework. Yes. When they're stressed out, they just like, they just kind of close down because teenager because but I can't teenagers. really blame them. I mean, it's stressful. This whole and pandemic this, thing. 
So this is this is one of those where the worse it gets, the worse it gets. Yes, that is the reinforcing loop of that missing homework, nice. more stress, more missing homework. Gosh, so failure. What is failure? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. So it, it's interesting when I look at these. Um, I mean, we could talk about solving them later. Right now, I want to observe how similar they are. Yes. Because we we each tried to solve a problem with an inhibiting loop. Yeah. Um, but at some point, we ran out of a precious resource. Yes. Patience or disk space, and that threshold tripped us into a reinforcing loop um, right. that made the problem worse and continues yes. to make it worse. Y yes. And, and you can't get out of one of these situations by trying harder. Right. Well, the first thing I want to observe uh, for you, Jess, is, is that while it's your responsibility to be patient with your child, like you, in the sense that you have to deal with the consequences if you're not, it's not your fault that you yell. It's not, it's not like you could just stop yelling is not helpful. Right, right. It, this is an example of where trying to blame the human of being like, just be more patient, just do more work, just do it better, just don't put any bugs in your code. Correct. It's not going to help because you're not just you, you're in a system with some software, with a bunch of other people, and you're influencing each other. All those elements in that system are influencing each other. And this, so, in my opinion, is what makes the difference between a programmer and a software developer. Between junior and senior or moving up to principal, it's that awareness of it's, it's not just about work harder. It's look at the whole system. Alan Kay said yesterday that real engineering is dealing with the whole system. Virtual yesterday, but yes. Oh, right, the other day. <laughs> Correct. Yeah, yeah. The, the, and, and that ability to zoom into problems and zoom out of problems as opposed to just trying to deal with the symptoms at the current level yeah. that's a hallmark of of um, maturing as a developer it's one of the major challenges of our work being able to zoom out and remember why we're doing something look at the people um, the other software that's influenced that we interoperate with and also zoom in and figure out what to type next and some people seem to just do that naturally, but our observation is uh, that this is a teachable, learnable skill. In fact, if you don't have it, that's fine. You can learn it. You learn it. And the way to learn it, or one way to learn it, one important step is to start looking for these systems patterns. Yes. So today we want to go over these patterns uh, the three patterns of balancing loop or inhibiting loop, either one, threshold and reinforcing loop with the goal that you'll notice that you already see these in software. As software engineers, we have the opportunity to understand these. Yeah, we have uh, a and, laboratory and a microscope. Yeah, and we have like incidents to, to notice these things. We can find these patterns and then we can see them in real life because we're not just software developers, we're also people. <laughs> And whoa, 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 whoa. Oh, just okay. slow, of, slow your roll a little people. bit. Come on now. We're people. No, it's okay. absolutely true. I, I can't be a better software engineer than I am a person. Because as people, <laughs> we live in these complex systems and we live and breathe these complex interactions every day. Uh, so we can also take notice, right. notice these patterns there and take that insight back to work with us in our socio-technical systems of software and people. Right, and, and, and all the effects that we create have effects. Right. And all the effects that other people and other systems create have effects on us. And being able to look at this in the whole, as opposed to saying, well, whose fault is it? Be more patient. You know, if you didn't right. drink so much coffee, if you meditated more, that would fix the 
problem. When you, when you find yourself trying to blame a human, that's a flag that there's a system involved and step back and look at the forces acting on them. Um, so one of those forces to look for, especially when a, a person is resistant to change, according to you, is, a, is the balancing or inhibiting loop. Uh, this pattern appears in all stable systems, or by stable, I mean con continuing, not static. Yes. Um, the balancing loop is what keeps things the same or right. close to the same. Uh, so what are some good examples of that, Ken? Well, I, the one that always st sticks in my mind is the, uh, the temple that's a thousand years old, that's 20 years old. Oh, oh, where the, it, that's in Japan, where they've somehow created a system that continually renews the same temple by rebuilding it every 10, 20 years. They Got build it. it every year, and then that's the temple while they're building the next one over here, and then that's the temple. That's and cool. along, I'm sure somebody came along and had better ideas for how to do this. And maybe some of those were incorporated, but yeah, in general, but the, it's a very the cubist, the cubist an design. extreme of, of continuity in our world. Right. Um, and and uh, uh, didn't you say the World Heritage, whatever, the, the, the UN refused to designate this a World Heritage Yeah, because site? they're like, that's not the original because they're not recognizing the system. The process is what stays the same, not the particular molecules. And, and in there have to be a bunch of balancing loops. Yeah, yeah, but let's talk software. Okay. Uh, Alan Kay brought up that fault tolerance is essential because fault tolerance reacts to errors by restarting what's necessary instead of propagating those into more and more errors. Right. So that errors right. lead to fewer errors right if you're in a if you're in a state that you you don't recognize restarting seems like well why don't you just fix it well restarting gets you back to a known state yeah and that's the first step that's a quick balancing loop that software can often do by itself um so if you've got like you know kubernetes and you've got a set number of um, services that you should be running and some of them go down and Kubernetes restarts them. That's a balancing loop implemented in software. Yeah. And then there's automated tests. Yeah, yeah. which uh, it, the uh, book says embrace change, uh, but oddly automated tests prevent change or, exactly. or inhibit, inhibit change. They now, inhibit change if you react to a red. The intention, the intention is they inhibit changes that you don't want, mm -hmm. which should enable changes that you do want. But they are there to keep you from changing the code. Yeah, so automated tests are an inhibiting loop unless you ignore them. That inhibiting loop includes you. It's yes. not entirely implemented in software. It requires the developers to react to a red test by either making the code do the same thing as before or adjusting the expectations in the test. Yeah, and I think that was a point I didn't make strongly enough in the early days of TDD. Oh. Uh, I was thinking of the system as the software, not the system is the team. And this technique is part of the loop that the team uses to prevent unwanted changes while leaving open the option of wanted changes. Right. The system, the somathesy is the team and the software is on the team. And yes. those automated tests, totally on the team. Absolutely. Yeah. How about uh, daily standups? Daily standups keep things the same. Well, it's like any ritual, right? Any ritual is about providing continuity. Like, oh, code reviews are about preserving the code style and keeping it consistent, meaning dampening fluctuations. And you want to keep things from getting too far out of line. Yeah, yeah. And and then in our in our companies and our organizations, um, sometimes we hit people who get in the way uh, because and then when you widen it up, you might find that, oh, this person who doesn't want to pair, maybe that has to do with the individual performance reviews that count tickets with their name on them. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So there would be it would be career suicide for them to pair. Yeah, or the salesperson who's asked to go after large companies but evaluated every quarter. 
Yeah, yeah. If, if your sales are, you get fired after the first quarter and it takes eight months to close a sale. Oh, minimum with the large. You're company. not gonna. You're not gonna do that. Right. Right. So that whenever, whenever you want to blame a person, widen and ask why is that person doing that? What are they trying to keep the same? Oh, and go. Some some of these inhibiting loops, they're there um, to prevent bad change too. And sometimes they succeed at that. For instance, a large company with like HR and legal departments that people listen to would maybe not issue a blank public statement that you shouldn't talk about politics at work and immediately dissolve the DEI council. There, there would be an there would be inhibition to that behavior. There are positives to these inhibiting loops. They're there for a reason. But just like we change our automated tests when the software needs to do something different, we can work on changing those inhibiting loops. Uh, the the bad news is you don't control them. The good news is you can influence them. Correct. I think that that's a theme as we've revisited systems thinking for our warning commercial plug workshop invitation to systems thinking, which we give from time to time. When's the next one? Um, June. June. Uh, but you'll have to get on our mailing list to hear about it. Okay, enough plug. A end of the plug. I had to put that in there, right? You do. Um, okay. So, so when Alan says that we're dealing with the whole system, or more of the system, as we as we gain in seniority, as we get better at this, uh, the whole system. Yeah, there is no whole system except the universe, maybe, maybe. Um, but what he mean doesn't he doesn't mean that we control the whole system. We're within the system and we influence it. Yes. Um, which uh, I think that's uh, that can be disconcerting. As as a junior, you you, oh, yeah. you you don't know how to like fix bugs, and then you learn how to fix bugs and make and we code get behave. control over our program. You can have Absolutely. control over a program, but when software gets involved in interoperating with other systems and and humans using it, right. there is no control. There is right. a lot of influence, but there is influence. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Next pattern, um, thresholds. You hit a threshold on disk space. I hit a threshold on patience that led to a behavior that changed the structure of the system and surprised us. And the uh, changed the behavior of the system, not the structure. There were two loops, and there were always two loops in both. That's pictures. true, but we we just didn't see those loops. There are always infinitely many loops that we don't see and aren't looking at. But suddenly, suddenly that disk space, that reinforcing loop of uh, running out of disk space, causing more crashes, suddenly that became really relevant and and overwhelmed our balancing loop of trying to help. Right. And and suddenly it was always there. Mm -hmm. the, the threshold was there. So so part of the behavior of systems is this is this moment of surprise when you make a small change, yeah, and something gigantic happens. The straw like the, that breaks the camel's back. Yeah, yeah, I like the one that AWS Kinesis outage, which like uh, spiraled into outages of several AWS um, services and caused a bunch of websites to go down. I think that was under a year ago, where they added one more node and that. Each node was communicating to each other node on a thread, and they added the 1,024th node and ran out of threads, and everything went down. It, yeah, and, and 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 somebody adds a thousand and first, and they're like, "Yeah, worked again, of course." Yeah, yeah thousand yeah. and second. Yeah, we're good. How many that more do you want? Give me another pressure. thirty. Sure, yeah. no problem. So for now, they're going to bump the number of threads available and get the system back up. They did that. But also, they'll look into how can we uh, make the behavior of our system not dependent on the thread limit. Right. There, That's a much this, longer term. There was this odd coupling between thread limit and the architecture of the system. Yeah. Another threshold is response time. Um, your right. website is fast enough until it hits 500 milliseconds and suddenly every, every few milliseconds matters. 
Yes. And, and, and going from 300 to 350 is no big deal, but going from 450 to 500 is a big deal. Yeah. And it's not just your service that's impacting that. It's a much wider system to look at. How about the, uh, another threshold is the size of teams. Yeah. Yeah. The size of teams, because actually let me draw that one. Okay. Um, share content. At some point, um, your your team gets big enough. Then what happens? Um, at some point, your team gets big enough. There's a threshold there around what eight to twelve somewhere in there. Yeah. Uh, where you can't just talk to each other and have information magically pass, you start to increase coordination costs. Which reduces progress. And, and sometimes you even like grind to a halt on your development. And then what do people do? What do managers do? Mythical man month. Classic book. Uh, Read it if you life. haven't. And it, Jess is also summarizing it. Uh, the well, entire this, thing. This right particular here. chapter is about adding people to a project. Adding people to a late project makes it later. Right. So when progress slows, there's a temptation to choose to increase the team size. Yeah. Um, which increases which, coordination costs and reduces progress. Less prog progress leads to more team size. And that yeah. makes a reinforcing loop. Right. So again, you hit a threshold um, because the coordination costs increase non-linearly. And at very small, when you have a non-linear growth effect, the trick is keep it small. Yes. Be because there's that point and you'll cross it very quickly and it'll surprise you where coordination costs go from insignificant to uh, completely stalling the project. Yeah, yeah. N squared is not a problem if N is one. Exactly. Or in this case, you can even deal with seven, but that's about it. Um, I could. This is worse than N squared. But the, the point is, this reinforcing loop uh, spirals out of control, and we call this is the third pattern: reinforcing loops, and we call them reinforcing loops, not positive feedback loops. Some people call them positive feedback loops, but the thing is good or bad is different depending on, um, on which way it's going and whether you like it. Correct. But the thing is that if here coordination costs are leading to more coordination costs. Right. And less progress is leading to less progress. Right. It's one of the things I really enjoy about uh, visualizing systems in this way is that it's you can you can summarize, you can boil it down to the essence. You say we're we're adding people and it's not working. Well, that's because the more people you add, the less progress you make. And the less whoops, the less give me the pen. The less progress you make, the less progress you make. Right. More progress leads to more progress, less progress leads to less progress. That's a reinforcing loop. Right. Um, and these happen all the time. Let's see, at, at, a, at a program level, you've remarked that complicated code attracts complicated code. Yeah, if, you're, if you look at the, uh, the, say the cyclomatic complexity of the functions in your system, uh, there's going to be one gigantic one and then half is, and then there'll be two that are half that size. And there'll be four that are half that size and on down to lots and lots and lots of little tiny cyclomatic complexity one, uh, functions and people complain about that, but it works that way because if, if you have a, a new if statement that has to go someplace in the code, it's more likely to attach to one of these monsters than to some random little simple function someplace else. And if you run that over and over and over again, that preferential attachment over and over again, you're gonna end up with the most, with one function being much larger than any of the others. 
Right. So you get a power law distribution of competition. Correct. Um, yeah. Uh, oh, oh, let me tell you about my favorite um, okay. reinforcing loop in software. It's, it's DevOps. Okay. Um, so in DevOps, you have, you use some automation, but the important part isn't the automation. The important part is more deploys. Uh, when you do more deploys, that naturally leads to smaller change sets in each deploy. Yep. And that naturally leads to safer deploys, um, which makes people feel more comfortable. And when they're more comfortable, they're happy to do more deploys. Yeah, and it's it's even better than this because the more comfortable they are, the more likely they are to have ideas for better automation. And time to do the automation. Yeah. Yeah. So this is a this is a virtuous cycle. Well, it can be. We can run this the other way. All reinforcing loops can be vicious cycles or virtuous cycles. Correct. Depending on which way they're running. So if if somebody freaks out, if something interferes with comfort and they're like, code freeze. <laughs> Yeah. As soon as you introduce a code freeze, then uh, your deploys are going down. So your change sets get larger. Less then comfort, less, less deploys. Small. Less deploys means larger change sets, larger right. change you sets. More dangerous deploys, your safety goes down, your comfort goes down. All of a sudden, everyone's afraid to deploy again. That's right. Or code freeze. The... the yeah, people are like, we don't want your changes. We're afraid. And the cycle runs in reverse. So I, I remember when I really got reinforcing loops as a as a thinking tool, um, how how liberating it was because I could be in a really horrible situation where everything we did made the problem worse. Yeah, and by, by doing fewer deploys, they're trying to help. Exactly. And, and, but everyone else can be panicked or, or depressed. And as soon as I can find the reinforcing loop, ah, we just need to run this the other way. Now it can oh, be difficult. So that, that very cycle that was the problem becomes its own solution. Correct. Correct. I, I don't have to, I don't have to understand everything and I don't have to somehow magically carry the world on my shoulders. I just have to find the loop and find a way to run it the other way. Find and a way to influence that's the, right. the different components. Yeah, run, run is a little controlly. I got it. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> but for example, you could just start making chain sets smaller or you could start making deploys safer. And we're not going to get into all the different ways there are to, uh, to influence systems because there's a just as there's a discipline of seeing systems, there's also a discipline of influencing systems. And that's what the other eight hours of the workshop are for. Oops, I plugged again, sorry. Um, <laughs> but let's let's get back to our original stories and see what we can see about them. Now that we, now that we have gone over these patterns, what can we do? Um, right. Right, so I'm you know one thing I wanted to mention was what when I want to figure out what to do on on my problem with the homework, I could look at it from Ren's perspective. Yeah. So from Ren's perspective, one day they look at their missing homework, they do some of it, they come to me and they said, Mom, I did some homework, or I asked them, Did you do your homework? And they're like, Yes. And I'm like, oh. So I go and I check. And I look at the list of homework and I mean, yeah, they did some, but oh my gosh, there's so much more missing more than I even knew about. And so, and, and I had a, a bad day because I had to fill out forms or something. And so I go yell at them. So, so from, from Ren's perspective, doing homework leads to yelling. Yeah. Those were the events. The outside of a system looks like a series of events and those yes. events can be confusing and, and in this case it, it like screws up Bren's uh incentive to do homework that's for sure or and to talk to you about it and to talk to me about it which is even worse because now we're reducing information flows and that's usually terrible 
Uh, but from those events, when we, when we, if, if Bren asks for my perspective, now this is not their job, they're a teenager, it's my job as an adult, as the principal engineer or senior dev on software to, to think about it more broadly and to see that my behavior of yelling came out of uh, the lack of patience and that came out of more missing homework and so on. Uh, those are the behaviors of the system. Yes. And so, I could try mm -hmm. to change that by just not yelling. Correct. And, and we've already established the futility of that. It's a stopgap. Maybe I can stop myself from yeah. yelling once, but in the meantime, I better get changing the system so that I'm not stressing myself out. Right. Right. So, so what's a, what's a, what's a, a small scale change that you can make to the system? Uh, well, one thing I can do is I can zoom in on the stress and try to address that directly. For instance, if I notice that they're stressed out, this has helped in the past. Um, I, I can suggest we walk down the street and get frozen yogurt. Mm -hmm. So we could go to the Froyo, the frozen yogurt place down the street, because that reduces stress. More for a uh, uh, other way around. It's a circly one. Oh, you're right. More fro froyo is less stress, stress, right? It's more for yeah. I'm trying to create a balancing loop. Things correct. Uh, so oop, well, I don't know where. There we okay, go. So so I can create a balancing loop with stress directly. I mean that could help with a lot of things. It could help with stress that's not even caused by their missing homework. Yep. Um. But but what really happened here, uh, that since I actually had this problem, um, what really happened was their, their teachers talked to me, their, their principal got in contact with me and we had a conference with their teachers and the teachers noticed that Ren was really stressed out. And because this is seventh grade um, and it's COVID and the, the school is like, we need to take care of these kids. They reacted to the stress by directly reducing the missing homework. And that kind of, it deactivated this reinforcing loop. Right. Just long enough for Ren to get their homework under control, kind of have a reset. And then um, the, with the Froyo and the, the teachers keeping an eye out, they were able to catch up and uh, stop this loop from spiraling. It, which which suggests to me that there's a there's a threshold associated with missing homework that's not reflected in the diagram yet. Like the, you, certain, you said that they there was a, there's a certain point where it's just out of control. Right. That's a right. property of reinforcing loops because if you're looking for nonlinear effects, order of n squared or n factorial or something, there is nothing more surprising than a reinforcing loop. Yes, because everything this, was fine, and then it was when startups are trying to disrupt. They are looking or uh, achieve hypergrowth. They are looking for reinforcing loops. The more useful, the more people use Facebook, cool. the more useful Facebook is. So the more people use Facebook. Yeah. And then you destroy democracy. Whoopsie. <laughs> um, okay. So, so let's look at, let's look at the, uh, the disc one. Like what's okay. the, uh, okay. the, the short term. And, and, and I like this, uh, I, I get to draw the, the solutions. So, so okay. what can I do? All right. Well, I mean, you already added another disk, right? Yes. So, so as disk the, the, space goes down, I can add the, capacity. Consider the root cause of this to be running out of disk space. You might just add another disk. And right. Cool. So, do so that I get some today. sort of alert. Ah. Okay. Medium yep. term, you can set up. A, I mean, today, add a disk. Yes. For tomorrow, set up an alert such that as disk space goes down, you get more alerts. Okay, so more less disk space increases. gives more alerts, right? And and more alerts gives me more disk space because you you deliberately uh, choose to add disk space in response to an alert. Right. So now I have a balancing loop. Right. So that can like keep the system on its feet a little longer. Uh, what you want, what you don't want to do, the dangerous thing would be to try to change the behavior of the people. Yes. And say, developers, stop adding those log statements. They're dangerous. Right. 
Right. If we if if we have uh, yeah, if we don't... eliminate this link, that 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 does eliminate the positive the uh, reinforcing loop, but it also eliminates the balancing loop that lets us reduce the number of crashes. Right. It removes our tools. It takes away our freedom and therefore responsibility to uh, investigate and find out why it's crashing. Um, that's dangerous. Uh, but a really power, a really powerful thing to do. To, we want to get rid of the reinforcing loop and not the balancing loop. Right. Right. So let's erase that line between log and disk space. Distributed logging. It's a thing. Your system needs to grow up and use it, Ken. Uh, okay. <laughs> yeah, that uh, that's uh, what I like about this style of problem solving is it's it's not it's not a finger pointy. It's not a you should have known or how could no, you have you shouldn't have used distributed logging from the beginning. That probably was not uh, an easy thing to do. It didn't exist back in my day. <laughs> yeah, kids and your distributed damn logging. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Exactly. But now it's but this is why we have to evolve our system as the world keeps evolving, because we do find ways of dissolving these problems. Right. And and if this is the picture with with that link severed, okay. I have a I still have my balancing loop. You still might run out of disk space, but it won't be because of logging. Right. Um, but but I, the reinforcing loop is gone. And this this is the sense that that we wanted to talk about thinking in terms of systems, taking a step back from the immediate uh, events that you're observing and saying, what is the system that creates these events? So to to uh, uh, recap, we have, uh, and there's tons more, we, we each have books and books and books about this. There's tons more to this. We have uh, balancing loops where an effect causes less of an effect. That's for, for stability to keep things the way they are or closer to the way that they are. Correct. And then we have, uh, uh, we have thresholds, thresholds to watch out for, which when we're always talking about effects affecting effects here, a threshold means that the effect one effect has on another suddenly becomes suddenly becomes Relevant. much greater. Yeah. And then we have reinforcing loops where an effect causes more of itself. And these, and that's, those are often dangerous. Oh, they're uh, also great. Yeah, they're, I think they're, yes, yes. They're, yeah, they're dangerous yeah. be, because they have these sudden large scale effects. Yeah, but they're also how we get to a new place in a lot of, in a lot of cases. Well, uh, someone makes distributed logging easy, some, and then everyone starts using. A lot of people start using distributed logging, and then we get to work on new problems. Or you, or you, you, you're two people writing a testing framework on an airplane, and the more people use it, the better the testing framework gets, and the more people have books about it, and the more people, yeah, and it, uh, get, that's how two it people grows. can change Never. the world. Reinforce through through reinforcing loops. Reinforcing loops change the world for a good or bad way. Look for them in your software. YouTube recommendations uh, are a reinforcing loop. When you watch a video about something and then it starts showing you more videos about something. And so you go even deeper and deeper into that thing. And pretty soon you think vaccinations are going to insert a Bill Gates microchip in your arm and and and, and and how did that even happen? Um, it's so yet, absurd. Okay, this happened to my parents. Um, <laughs> oh. And they're very high risk. And yet the thing to do when you can recognize that someone is caught in one of these reinforcing loops, that, that they're getting different sources of information than I am. And, and it's, not, it's not their fault and they're not stupid. Correct. They're getting different inputs. They're part of a system. And the and worst thing Jane, that I could without, do, go ahead. Yes, go ahead. The worst thing that I could do is cut off contact with them. 
and be like, I don't want to talk to you anymore because you believe things that don't make sense to me. The, because the best balancing loop we have to bring us together is to stay in contact, is right. to share information a little bit, or at least share connection. And if you're not part of the system, you can't be part of the solution. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You can't fix this stuff from outside because we don't control these systems. We are in them and we influence them. Yeah. So in software, think about the reinforcing loops that you're stuck in, that other people are stuck in, that we're creating for the people who use our software. Um, and that's as as we think wider and wider this is how we advance in our career and have more impact in software and we can do this on our world congratulations you've just graduated from programmer to software developer <laughs> now go listen to alan k's keynote again which we is might what get I'm, to software engineering you might get to software engineer Jess, thank you so much for fixing my logging problem. I really appreciate that. My servers are no longer crashing. Kent, thank you. And everyone else, uh, find us at systemsthinking.dev. Thank you now so we have, much. We have Just time for some QA, right? Yes, we absolutely have time for QA. So um, there's been a lot of discussion on the keynote channel. Seems like the homework example really resonated with many people. <laughs> So um, I'm gonna, any, anyone who wants to post questions either on Zoom or, or the keynote channel, please do so. I didn't really see any questions, um, just a lot of commentary on the reinforcement uh, loops, inhibiting loops. Uh, I wish, I, I have to say that I wish there's an inhibiting loop around Zoom meetings because there's so many of them. <laughs> well, it's, it's our job to, to look for that to look for opportunities to create that. I guess, so I have a question. Uh, what are, what's a good example of two loops that are in conflict with each other, but they're both loops that you actually are trying to get positive, you know, results out of? Um, it's, it's, it's a common thing to have a balancing loop and a reinforcing loop fighting. Um, sometimes you get uh, the, the same kind of loop working in the opposite direction, and then something can tweak the strength of one or the other. Can, can you think of any examples off the top of your head? Well, that, that's the basis for the explore, expand, extract. You get this, that logistic curve. You have a, you have a reinforcing loop, and then you run out of market, or you, wh whatever causes. The reinforcing the loop is the scaling, is the, the network growth. Right. And the inhibiting loop is whatever causes your growth to tip over. So uh, the inhibiting loop is running out of new customers. Right. Sue so, John, I, I took your question to be something like we would like uh, operational stability and innovation at the same time. Excellent example. And those two things seemed to be in conflict. I mean, th they are in the sense that every time you make a change, you might break things. So just don't make any changes. Well, you can't do that because there are always going to be changes. So uh, in a case like that, I would look for solutions that actually support both, like smaller deployments. Or boundaries. We're going to make quick right? changes here and, and more careful changes over here in our big money-making system. Okay. And, and, and try to make sure that the changes in the little playground can't affect or are less likely, yeah. let's be honest, less likely to affect the, the money-making machine. Decoupling <laughs> the rates of consequences and change, uh, the rates of change and the consequence of change is a really useful part of systems thinking. Let some pieces move quickly and some pieces move slowly. The, the, the bigger it is, the more systems interoperate with it, the, the wider impact it has, the more slowly it needs to change. And that's important. Okay, awesome. We, we have several questions on the uh, Kino Slack channel. So I'm gonna start there. Uh, Timothy Stas asks, what are your thoughts on the theory of constraints? Uh, like uh, Ellie Goldratt's theory of constraints. Mm -hmm. um, 
this it's very useful. I like it a lot when you're trying to um, to to speed up the flow of something. Yeah, look at the constraints. Um, when often it's like deploys take too long and deploys are the are the slowest thing until you automate them and then you very quickly get to QA the bottleneck. Um, so I, I was thinking about drum buffer rope uh, this morning during my walk. Did you say I'm drum in. buffer rope? Uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, the marching, uh, scouts. Okay. Where the, where there's one scout that? who, right. who goes slower than everyone else. Put that scout in the front. Put that scout in the front. And it's, it's so backwards and so many teams that I work with, uh, to try to consult with or coach are trying to get the fastest person to go faster and not trying to get everyone to go together that they end up the, the, that fastest person ends up spending all of their time coming back to help and nobody makes any progress. So Alan, I, Alan remarked that um, if you, if you stick, if you start with the optimizations, you don't get to anything great. Um, compared to doing something great slowly and then optimizing it. Um, yeah. That's one of the differences between programming, programming algorithms, data structures, make it fast, whatever. Systems thinking are about the complex interactions and the meaning and, and everyone matters. It doesn't matter how quickly you can deliver features if they just pile up in QA and become work in progress and become inventory and choke choke anything you're trying to really do. Awesome. Uh, Aaron Todd asks, do you have any tips for recognizing if you're stuck in one of these bad loops? Oh, sure. yes, yes. Go. <laughs> so one of them, what's, what's the German word for it, Kent? Verschlimmbesserung, uh, and I apologize for my accent, which is, I love German because these compound words, it's a, it means uh, to make things worse by attempting to make them better. When you find yourself doing that, one, it's not your fault, you were trying, but now that you're aware of it, step back and look at the wider system. The other, the other, the other one is, um, that person is the problem. Yes. If you see someone else as being in the way, uh, again, step back and look at the wider system and look at it from their perspective and see if you can see the events that they see and the behaviors and structure behind them. Okay. Um, Mort Goldman asks, what do you think about Boyd's uh, OODA loop? I mean, he's right. <laughs> yeah, and, and it's never helped me. I, I, I'm very seldom in a, in a zero-sum competition in development. In poker, it helps a lot. Oh, in, uh, not, by never, you mean in software? In software, like I'm not in a competition with somebody and if I can get them react, like, no, we're working together on something. That's the scale at which I work. I suppose if I had a company in a competitive marketplace, I, I might think about it differently. I, I would argue that even there, you and your competitors are together creating that market. Yes. With anything remotely new. But, you still, but you still want to crush them like bugs. Wait, what'd you say? You bugs? still want to crush them like bugs. <laughs> Maybe you do. <laughs> Cooperatively. <laughs> I want the cake. They can have the crumbs. I want the wider system to work more smoothly. Also and, true. And that rarely happens when one person dominates the market. and Also true. Yeah, and controls the pace of change. Eh? Okay, okay. Sam, Sam asks about um, momentum in the flywheel effect. And I guess I'll add to that question is, you know, there's kind of like micro loops and macro loops. So, you know, at an organizational level, you see certain like positive flywheels that help the entire organization and lift the level of learning and knowledge. So curious to hear what you guys think about the flywheel effect kind of at, you know, the, the micro and the macro level. Um, the, the flywheel effect is once once you have some momentum, it's really easy to add others and, and it just keeps moving. Uh, you can do this with like communication. Um, uh, if, if people actually 
read, people won't write documentation unless they're reading it and constantly modifying it. And, and so you can either have a culture of keeping some good documentation or not, um, but it, it has to be in motion. Um, at, okay. Go ahead. And the natural, natural, the observed feedback loop is that by the time you read the documentation, it's useless. There's right. a, there's a trade-off effect. <laughs> the slower the information changes and the larger the audience for the information, the, the more you should spend on writing stuff down. And, and what I see is people mindlessly, uh, thoughtlessly, of course, now I'm blaming the people, Jessica, and so you call me on this, just saying you should document everything. Um, yeah, so I was reading Von Forster the other day, and he talks about the connection between freedom and responsibility. If you tell everyone they must document everything, then they can't exercise responsible documentation. Right. Because like you said, res it's responsible to document anything with a large audience, like outside your team that changes slowly because you have to maintain compatibility because it's interoperating with things that are outside your sphere of control. Um, that should be documented, but internal things that are likely to change before anyone uses it. Uh, and, and, and you could pair with the person instead, no. Uh, so we need that that freedom, that choice to exercise responsibility of making these decisions with full context. There is no one right answer for anything. It's right. all contextual, and that's painful. <laughs> and, and and that context can change. You know, you you yeah. the first version of JUnit didn't need documentation, and very soon it really did because it needed the people were investing. Uh, billions of dollars against this API. So it better not change. Yeah. So that, and there were millions of people doing it. And the users and the maintainers and the documentation and the community and the user and, and these, these, these spirals form that are, are like these flywheels of uh, you, you get momentum, you're in the, the positive side of the reinforcing feedback loop. Um, and then you need to feed all of those elements um, if you want to keep it growing. I think I'm gonna try to squeeze one more question in before we hand the room back to Tom at 12. Uh, our so Aaron Todd asks, are balancing loops inherently at risk, i.e. those involved get too comfortable? Um, are they inherently at risk? Some of them are pretty strong when you get like the predator prey one. Um, there's, um, but maybe balance, well, people can lose the purpose of balancing loops. They can yeah. actually be too strong in a lot of cases and start inhibiting more changes than they were intended to. Especially as like jobs pass from person to person, you don't even have the same people with historical perspective in there. Um, so if you have like a, 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 some tests, right? You lose track of what this test is doing and why it exists. And you just keep it there because someone might be depending on it. That's painful. Um, yeah, other one, but so that's one form of decay. Uh, and yeah, probably there's another form of decay that is not serving its original purpose. It's just existing to preserve itself now. I do this because it's my job and we have to keep doing this because otherwise I wouldn't have a job. Awesome. Well, I uh, want to thank you both, Jessica and Ken, again, for a wonderful keynote. Um, we're so fortunate and lucky to have both of you here at ET. Um, fantastic talk, amazing comments on the keynote. So um, folks, uh, enjoy the rest of the day. And uh, thank you, Jessica and Ken. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, everyone.